1974, the world woke up to a mushroom cloud over the Thar Desert, and India became the pariah no one saw coming. The country that supposedly couldn't feed itself had just detonated a nuclear device. And the global response? Complete shock. Because this wasn't just about a bomb. This was about a country dismissed as third world, joining the most exclusive club on earth, whether the club wanted them or not. If you think nuclear power is just about bombs, you're missing the real story. This is about how India went from international sanctions to a nuclear arsenal rivaling superpowers. And they did it in secret, under the world's nose, while being economically strangled. Let's go back to where it started. But before we dive in, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button and leave a comment, I subscribe. And I'll personally welcome you into the family. With that said, let's get started. May 18, 1974. Operation Smiling Buddha. Dr. Raja Ramana stood in a bunker 20 kilometers from the test site. He was 45 years old. He'd grown up during British rule, watching his country humiliated on the world stage. Now, he was about to change everything. The device they'd built was hidden 107 meters underground. At 8.05 a.m., Ramana gave the order. The desert shook. A crater 47 meters wide appeared. India became the sixth nuclear power overnight. But here's the twist that sparked global fury. They'd used a Canadian reactor. The Cyrus reactor, gifted to India for peaceful purposes, civilian energy research. Indian scientists had quietly extracted plutonium from it. When Canada asked what happened, India's answer. It was a peaceful nuclear explosion. A technical loophole. A diplomatic middle finger. Canada felt betrayed. The US felt blindsided. And Prime Minister Indira Gandhi? She smiled and said India had proved it could defend itself. But that explosion almost destroyed India's future. Because the world's response? Economic strangulation that should have ended India's nuclear dreams forever. Within months, the US created the Nuclear Suppliers Group, an international cartel specifically designed to isolate India. All uranium imports? But technology transfers? Frozen. International scientific collaboration? For 24 years, 1974 to 1998, India lived in nuclear winter. A 1989 MIT study estimated these sanctions stunted India's economic growth by 2.1% annually. That's hundreds of billions in lost GDP. Indian scientists couldn't attend international conferences. Families were split between national duty and career opportunities abroad. Let me tell you about Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. In 1963, NASA rejected his application to work on rocket technology because he was Indian. Decades later, he became the father of India's missile program. The man they wouldn't let wash beakers at NASA ended up building ICBMs that could reach any capital city in the region. Imagine your country's brightest minds treated like criminals for wanting security. But while the world celebrated shutting India down, something was happening in the desert. Something invisible to spy satellites. Something that would humiliate Western intelligence agencies. India was building something. And nobody knew. Fast forward to May 11, 1998. The Pokhran test site in Rajasthan. Over three days, May 11, 12, and 13, India detonated five nuclear devices. Thermonuclear weapons. Tactical nukes. The works. The CIA? Completely blindsided. The Washington Post later reported that US intelligence satellites detected nothing. No unusual activity. No warning signs. The CIA didn't know until Indian Prime Minister Vajpayee announced it to the world. How did they pull this off? Indian scientists moved equipment at night. They dressed as farmers. During satellite passes, they mimicked irrigation work. Scientists were given code names of Hindu deities to confuse foreign intercepts. They even left old tire tracks from the 1974 test to make it look like abandoned infrastructure. The greatest deception of the nuclear age. One device, the thermonuclear bomb, had a yield of 45 kilotons. That's three times the Hiroshima bomb. When Vajpayee addressed the nation, his first words were simple. India is now a nuclear weapon state. Q Global Outrage. 
sanctions returned, even harsher this time. The US called it the greatest intelligence failure since Pearl Harbor. But here's where it gets interesting. The sanctions that were supposed to crush India? They accidentally created something more dangerous. When you cut a country off from the global nuclear supply chain, one of two things happens. They collapse or they innovate. India chose innovation. Without access to foreign uranium enrichment, India built its own plants. Without heavy water imports, they developed indigenous production. They created pressurized heavy water reactors, PHWRs, entirely from scratch. But the real game changer? Thorium. India sits on 25% of the world's thorium reserves. While the rest of the world chased uranium, India built a three-stage nuclear program designed to eventually run on thorium, a fuel so abundant, it could power India for centuries. A 2018 International Atomic Energy Agency report called India's thorium program decades ahead of any other nation. It's like being banned from the app store, so you build your own smartphone from scratch. And it works better than the iPhone. Today, India operates 23 nuclear reactors independently. No foreign fuel. No foreign engineers. They've built fast breeder reactors, technology only three countries in history have successfully mastered. But nuclear power plants weren't the end game. India was building something that only five other countries in history had achieved. The nuclear triad. This is the ability to launch nuclear weapons from three platforms, land, air, and sea. It's the ultimate deterrent because even if an enemy destroys two of your platforms, the third can still retaliate. Here's India's triad. Land, the Igni V intercontinental ballistic missile. Range, over 5,000 kilometers. That covers Beijing, Shanghai, and every major city in China and Pakistan. Air, Mirage 2000 and Rafale fighter jets equipped with nuclear-capable missiles. These can be scrambled in minutes and strike anywhere in the region. C. INS Arahant, India's nuclear-powered submarine. It carries K-4 submarine-launched ballistic missiles with a range of 3,500 kilometers. Let that sink in. Only six nations on Earth have nuclear submarines. The United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, China, and India. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute's 2024 yearbook, India's submarine fleet makes it nearly impossible to launch a first strike against them. Because even if you destroy every land-based missile and every airbase, there's a submarine somewhere in the Indian Ocean that you can't find. And it will fire back. During Ionis Arahant's secret sea trials in the Bay of Bengal, Pakistani and Chinese submarines couldn't detect it for 90 days. It was a ghost. While the world was watching India's borders, it was silently patrolling the ocean floor. But here's what nobody's talking about. India promises it will never use nukes first. And that makes it more dangerous, not less. India's nuclear doctrine is called, no first use. It sounds peaceful. It sounds restrained. But here's what it actually means. If you attack us with nuclear weapons, we will annihilate you. There's no limited strike. No proportional response. India's doctrine is credible minimum deterrence, which is military speak for, we won't start it, but we'll make damn sure we finish it. Compare that to Pakistan, which does have a first use policy. Or the United States and Russia, which have never committed to no first use. India's restraint creates psychological pressure. It's the nuclear version of, I won't throw the first punch, but I'll make sure I throw the last. The Federation of American Scientists estimates India currently has between 164 and 172 nuclear warheads. That's smaller than the US or Russia, but more than enough to end civilization in South Asia. And then, everything changed again. After 30 years of being treated like a rogue state, one deal legitimized India overnight. The US-India Civil Nuclear Agreement. For the first time since 1974, the United States lifted nuclear sanctions on India. Not only that, the US officially recognized India as a responsible nuclear power. This was a geopolitical earthquake. Why the flip? Three reasons. China's rise. By 2008, China was becoming a superpower. The US needed a strategic partner in Asia. 
India was the obvious choice. India's clean record. Despite having nukes for 34 years, India had never proliferated. No black market sales. No rogue scientist scandals. Compare that to Pakistan's AQ Khan, who sold nuclear secrets to North Korea, Libya, and Iran. Economics. India's GDP was growing 7-9% to annually. It was too big to ignore. Sanctions were hurting American companies more than they were hurting India. The deal gave India access to $150 billion in nuclear commerce, according to a Brookings Institution analysis. Diplomats who'd spent their entire careers fighting sanctions were suddenly dining at the White House. Henry Kissinger called it a historic transformation in global power dynamics. The country once punished for going nuclear was now celebrated for it. So where does India stand today? The answer will shock you more than anything you've heard so far. As of 2024 to 2025, India has the sixth largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Nuclear energy capacity, 7,480 megawatts, World Nuclear Association. Plans to triple nuclear power output by 2032. Developing MIRV technology, multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. That's one missile with multiple warheads that can hit different targets. Only the US, Russia, UK, France, and China have this. India launched its second nuclear submarine, Ice Aragat, in 2024. There are rumors of a third already under construction. And then there's the Agni-6 missile. It's not officially confirmed, but intelligence analysts estimate a range of 8,000 to 12,000 kilometers. That's anywhere on Earth. India went from nuclear outcast to nuclear kingmaker in 50 years. It did this without invading anyone. Without threatening neighbors. With a doctrine of restraint. So what does this mean for you? It means the balance of power has shifted. India is now in informal nuclear discussions with the UN Security Council. It's being treated like a great power. But there's a cost nobody's talking about. Pakistan. Every time India advances its nuclear capabilities, Pakistan accelerates its own program. As of 2024, Pakistan has an estimated 170-plus nuclear warheads, the fastest-growing nuclear arsenal on Earth, according to CIPRI. The arms race in South Asia is now the most dangerous nuclear flashpoint on the planet. Kashmir, the disputed region between India and Pakistan, is no longer just a territorial dispute. It's a potential trigger for nuclear war. A 2023 Pentagon report estimated a 20 to 40 percent chance of a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan in the next 20 years if tensions escalate. Dr. Christopher Clary, an expert on South Asian security at SUNY Albany, put it bluntly in 2024. The India-Pakistan nuclear rivalry is more unstable than the Cold War ever was. Because during the Cold War, the US and USSR had hotlines, treaties, and buffers. India and Pakistan share a border. Their capitals are minutes apart by missile. And both countries have fought four wars since 1947. Two countries with ancient grudges, separated by a disputed border, both with nuclear weapons and seven-minute warning times. So was India's nuclear journey worth it? In 1974, India exploded a bomb and became an outcast. In 2025, it's a strategic partner. The question is, did nuclear weapons make India safer? Or did they trap South Asia in a deadlock that could end civilization? India proved you can build power without colonizing others. But nuclear weapons are the one invention humanity can't uninvent. Here's the real question for you. If you were India's prime minister in 1974, would you have ordered the test, knowing the sanctions would come, knowing it would spark an arms race? Or would you have stayed non-nuclear and vulnerable? Drop your answer in the comments. But here's the twist. Whatever you choose, explain how you defend your country without the option you didn't pick. Would you risk isolation for security? Or gamble on diplomacy with no deterrent? Let's see who has the best strategy. Because in nuclear geopolitics, there are no perfect choices, only survival.